Um, I think it's also important to recognize the Slovenia um, Mirovni Institute dimension of this. One of my first texts written about this space, these spaces, probably even first written in 95 when I, you know, I came in 93, in, in that time I knew little but thought I knew a lot. Now it's worked the other way around, you know, in a sense. Um, but one of my first texts was very, was a lengthy reflection on the 80s Slovenia social movements. And I still find that social energy in Slovenia in the 80s very, very interesting. Uh, I was reminded as well that in God, 2000 or 2001, I was a guest at the um, Delavska Punkeska Universa. Um, and I think that was a very important attempt to keep alive some kind of alternative ideas and thinking. And now, of course, I look with great interest at the formation and, one might say, success of Druzhan and Levitsa. Um, but I think there's something else about the Slovenian. And, you know, I don't you know, how much we got into this sovereign methodological nationalism. I'm, you know, I don't want to be Slovenia, Croatia, post Yugoslav, blah, 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 but I probably will be in a sense. But I think, given some of my own interests, and it's exactly where Barbara ended, I think, for me, one of the, one of the long-term legacies of Slovenian movements, not reflected in the Croatian movements, is this legacy, I mean, even Freire was very influential in the 80s. Nobody reads Fieri in Croatia. I should say a lot about reading people in a way. Sorry about that. Um, but this kind of long-term activist commitment to social justice, to social welfare, to a different kind of welfare. Still in Croatia, sociala, it's over there somewhere. It's not an activist thing. I think it's changing. But Slovenia has, in my view, an incredibly active mental health movement, an incredibly active disability rights movement, an incredibly strong radical social work tradition. Um, and we don't have that in Croatia, and I'm jealous. And I think it's important, you know, it might be worth thinking about why, why that is the case, the absence. I also want to thank Asife, because I think what Asife is doing is stretching a liberal paradigm probably to its limits, I hope even beyond its limits, <laughs> beyond its limits, in times of neoliberalism. So I think that, that is extraordinarily interesting and important. And I may, I may come back to, to a bit of that. Um, Thomas Lowe and I were, um, were together three days ago and I hadn't the faintest idea what I was going to say. Um, and, and, uh, and he asked me what I was going to say. Oh, a bit of history. And he said, no, no, context, context, that's what we need. So, so I thought, well, okay, context and conjunctures. But for me, contexts matter. But they matter in a different way than people might think. Because contexts are not passive backgrounds to things. Contexts are enrolled uh, differentially in and through movement, energy, and activity. And I think that's really important. Because, you know, what you have in context and conjunctures are kind of combinations of time and space with different forces and tendencies coming together, condensed, if you like, with real effects on what is deemed possible. And that's the issue, you know, another world is possible. It's that issue about how conjunctures make it difficult to think outside of certain limits and certain paradigms. And, of course, different crises. And my God, I was thinking, when was Croatia not in a crisis? Um, and, and maybe the first 18 days of the Ratchan government in 2000 was, was that. But I mean, you know, constant crisis. But the, the nature of that crisis, war and authoritarian nationalism, uh, crisis of neoliberal austerity, crisis of neoconservative uh, reactionary configurations, those things change the kind of dominant hegemonic common sense and made what activists emphasized different in different periods. And that's the argument that, you know, in the 90s, we were so concerned with the dramatic violence and erasure of part of the population that we could only focus on a human rights paradigm. There was no room. 
for socio-economic justice, as if, as if a human rights, as if you know, what is oppressed through a human rights lens, but not oppressed through a socio-economic lens, as if they're not connected somehow. And I, you know, in the most recent text on the Soros Foundations in the region, I argue that that comes partly from a late Yugoslav Uydi, the, 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 the name of an organization I can't pronounce, but that kind of Udi notion that if only we had democracy, everything would be fine. Okay, there was Branko Horvat, but he was marginalized in a sense. And I, and I do think, you know, there's a lot of work now which is looking at the crises in Yugoslavia in the late 80s and saying that the issue of clientelized, marketized structures, what Jupanov called political capitalism, the nature of the structures of inequality and discontent were actually pushed through an ethnicized national. But that ethnicized nationalist lens does not exhaust the possibilities of understanding those crises in the 80s. So I think it was the configuration of activists that, that was incredibly important. And, and even I'm trying now to really dig in the archives in the 90s to look at, you know, did this liberal human rights paradigm say anything about the organized robbery of privatization in Tudjman's Croatia? The creation, Tudjman explicitly said, of a hundred families who would benefit economically from, from the transition. Did that human rights lens, working through a particular elitist avant-gardism, did it actually understand exactly the things Barbara was talking about, the layering of human rights, of social rights, the differentiation between different groups? deserving and undeserving. Uh, the mobilization of war veterans as both privileged and underprivileged and therefore angry. Uh, Bosnian Croats and sections of the Croatian diaspora in a new kind of hegemonic settlement. So the first part of my kind of throwing some things out to you is that actually it's much more, comp when we talk about conjunctures and the limits of the possible, it's much more complicated than simply saying in the 90s we couldn't think about material inequality. And, and actually I think some people were thinking about it, but that's, that's an important hidden thing. Second thing I want to say, I, I thought nobody read what I put on Facebook because I've got it so often, but I am perhaps a bit less interested in effective activism than affective activism. I, I don't want to bore you with the affective term in some kind of anthropology, sociology, feminist writings. But I do think that we need to take seriously in meetings like this and in activist research and research on and with activism of the emotional, visceral, gut feeling, embodied aspects of participation in movement activism. If we ignore that, and pretend we're in some rational choice world, then we really lose a lot. And, and, and Barbara, I mean, Barbara made the case much better than I can do from this kind of pseudo-intellectual level. Huh? But, you know, activism is part of a sustaining web of social relations. It makes our lives possible. It makes the possibility of hope possible. And so activist engagement can be marked by deep intimacies, by care for each other. Care, that's one of my Liverpool expressions. Sorry, care is <laughs> Love, love is another one. Love, love, care and love, sorry. <laughs> care, love and compassion. Of course, it can also be marked by deep antagonisms. I would challenge any of you to deny the, the fact that some of the some movements are still marked by people who fell out with each other in a big way quite a lot of years ago, and no one can remember why anymore, but it kind of has ripple effects on, on aspects of, of the movement. So I do think that's very, very important. And, and what really interests me in what, in what Barbara was saying, and I think it's about the last wave, the recent wave of the Croatian <coughs> movement, the work with asylum seekers, uh, the work around corruption in Zagreb that, that Thomas Lam and others were a part of, that reaching out to people, instead of seeing activism as a scene, 
as a kind of avant-garde, I would almost use the, the anthropological word tribe with its own initiation rituals, its own hierarchies, its own unspoken ideas about, well, you came late and you came from Carlevats. You know, that's a long way away, guys. Um, you know, sorry, no. Um, <laughs> so I do think, you know, I do think that relationship to, to challenging the notion of a scene is very, very important. Um, and to pay more attention Paying more attention to this is also crucial because of burnout. You know, I've seen people who, you know, to be an activist, and it, it happened, we were in Zelda Academia on the beautiful island of Wies, and we were supposed to work from 9 o'clock in the morning till 11 o'clock at night. <laughs> and at one point, I kind of said, I think the only thing that separates activists from ordinary people is the fact that we're still in fucking meetings at 10.30 at night, you know. <laughs> anyway, that's, you know, so let, let me just say that. Okay, why do I still insist on effective? I'm going to run out of time. I'm going to not talk about theory at all. That's okay. Look, participation in activism, engagement, embodied activism, is a life-changing event. Uh, Thomas Love and some colleagues, I don't think it's published, but a paper with Boyana Chulam and Karen Dulan, comparing uh, uh, students in Rijeka and participants in the right to the city protest. And they argue, quite rightly, it's not about whether a, a campaign, a protest succeeds or not that matters. Most of the people they interviewed said, this was the most important thing I've done in my life, and it's going to change me forever. I'm never going to be the same again. I'm going to think differently. I'm going to seek out different forms of engagement. And that seems to me to be crucial because the skills learned through activist engagement become central to future life trajectories, I think. Um, okay, one of the things I've tried to do with this intellectually is say that actually the scripts, yeah, anthropological again, the scripts that develop in a time of formative social action are quite resilient, even in the face of changing political institutional and historical circumstances. So times have changed, but we're still running it through the film of our most important activist engagements. And how to actually get out, you know, how to use that as a strength, but then also think about the issues of different and new conjunctures is really, really important. Um, five minutes, okay. I'll completely ignore the theory bit. Huh? Um, yeah. And that's where I argue that actually, and I think I'm wrong, you know, no, I wrote a text which you can find, and I, I thought I was going to talk about it, but I'm not. Uh, it's published in Polemos, you can find it, but this idea that there were different waves of activism in Croatia. And waves is nice because it's hard to tell where one wave ends and another begins, really, in a sense. And I'm actually more interested now in some of the relationships between the waves and so on. But the idea was that you had the anti-war campaign, uh, which was an ex experimental network, many of whose main actors had been involved in 80s movement activism in Croatia and Slovenia, Swarun, uh, some of the kind of reading of the constitution on the tram and so on, the performative activism. And they weren't killed by this dreadful shape of the um, civil society, newly composed NGO idea in which we have technocratic, professionalized forms. I don't think a later wave was killed by that, but what's important is the third wave. The third wave escaped from an NGO script and started to think about issues around commodification, uh, expropriation, and so on. And, and that was really, really important. I was going to say something about theory. Uh, I, uh, I get worried that there's kind of two positions that we tend to have in activist circles. Anti-theory or a-theory, a-theoretical, uh, you know, theory. Let's not do that. But we also have what I would call turbo-theory. Turbo-theory or hypo-theory, in which you have endless, commodified, fetishized performances from 
global theoretical superstars, the in vogue brand names in which we have festivals, events, and conferences. I hope you've all got your tickets for Julia Kristeva and the Filosofsky Theater of the Croatian National Theater. Um, theory shouldn't be about that. Um, theory should be humble. Theory should be about, Stuart Hall says, struggling, wrestling with the angels, fighting off theoretical fluency. Um, there's a lovely text, a blog by Sharon, Shannon Matten, who talks about theoretical humility. We should avoid deifying the big men of theory, assuming that they possess a greater truth that we must adopt wholesale. Theories are nothing more than models to help us make sense of things, frameworks to help us ask questions. And they're often women and practitioners, and more often than not, groups of people who develop their ideas collaboratively over time. And that seems to me to be intellectual labor that embodies a politics of theory and a relationship between theory and practice. And I was going to do something which, which I won't do now, but it was kind of this idea that maybe we can map, we can have a moving map of, of an alternative understanding of Croatian activism via kind of five very rough things. Marxism, no, stop. feminism, Marxism, anarchism, various forms of ecological theory, kind of post-colonial and um, anti-racist theory. And, and, you know, I mean, I was going, you know, there's a lot one can talk about. When you do it like that, when you, and it's absolutely not about holding on to one of those positions, it's about the dialogue between those positionalities and some other as well, of course, queer theory comes in within and beyond feminism and so on. But when one, when one puts those five on a map, you end up with a kind of different layering and a different understanding, you know. There were anarchist groups in Zagreb in the 90s, ignored by a liberal human rights paradigm, but who kept alive a certain kind of idea and halted globalization and so on. There were other stuff, lots of other stuff going on. Um, okay, where this leaves me is that perhaps within those five, there is a, a concept of the commons. Which can, which can fit uncomfortably and never conventionally across those five dimensions, particularly the practice of commoning, okay? The active making and claiming of commons, the protection of public space against enclosures, appropriations, and commodifications. Um, okay, I wrote that, then I suddenly had this weird moment of Oh my God, I'm going to end up treating the commons like liberals treated civil society in the 90s. You know? Precisely its flexibility means that one can appeal to everybody and nobody and it, it just becomes vacuous. I don't think it's that. I do think that commoning gives us a space to dialogue across those positions, to move away from a dead end of market fundamentalist politics, policy and economics. It may even break down the binary between reform and revolution. Um, yeah, I had some conclusions, but they've got nothing to do with what I said before, so I won't, I won't say it. Uh, except I do think rescuing the popular, rescuing the idea of everyday common sense, understanding people's survival, resilience, livelihood strategy, seems to me to be an incredibly important dimension to this. Um, so, Maybe, maybe in the end, maybe I do care about effective activism. Because effective activism requires us to learn from history, neither through nostalgia nor amnesia, to accumulate and share experiences like, like we're doing here, to avoid dogmatism and determinism, perhaps to be less quick, oh, I've done it with the human rights bunch, haven't I, all the time, sorry about that, less quick to label those who struggled before us or for different Things. You know, let, let's reach out. I'm reaching out in an antagonistic way. <laughs> the tactical, strategic, and political choices facing activists in these spaces require a frame which perhaps the Commons helps with, which is open, radical, 
theoretically informed, pragmatic, flexible, experimental, and utopian. Thanks.